Cool, we are live. Welcome everyone, Writing Nights presents in association with Sketches, Stories, and Sounds, Mr. Steve Brightman, and then following that will be an open mic. Daria's gonna hold the camera for me for a little bit, and we'll start momentarily. Smiley face. All right. Okay. You don't have to be real specific. I don't just, care which point at. Okay, just... <laughs> We're, you can go. move around if you want to. Get a look at our crowd here. Yeah, smile for the camera. You're all, you're all live on Facebook. Oh, I'm so used to this. <laughs> so. Okay, and we are in our stage there. So some technical stuff going on. You know, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes stuff. Okay, what do we got? Cool. All right. So... What? Oh. No, I don't know oh. why I'm asking you. Sorry. <laughs> Big old dreads, okay. Live here in just a minute, and some, some of you already are on Facebook Live. We're gonna count down, um, and you're gonna clap and cheer like there's a hundred of us in here, okay? Okay. Yeah, there are totally a hundred of us in here. Four, three, two, one. Woo! Featured performer. 
performer. His name is Steve Brightman. He lives in Akron, Ohio with his wife and their parrot. I think that they belong to the parrot, is how it actually works. <laughs> they have, he has one full-length collection of poetry titled The Wild Gospel of Careening and Other Sermons uh, from the Red Rumble, uh, which is Red Orchid Press. Steve firmly believes in only two seasons, winter and baseball. Please give it up for Steve Brayman! Thank you to The Outpost for having us. Thank you to Writing Nights. Um, this is actually pretty impressive. I'm digging this. Um, this is a, uh, first piece is going to be um, my favorite piece from the Writing Nights canon. <laughs> we'll deal with that later. Um, it's in the Squire, Volume 1. Oh, and yeah. I'm digging into the archives here. Oh, yeah, Writing Nights. Um, it's titled A Bouquet of Voices. There was no light like they said there would be, only a bouquet of voices. Some I'd recognized, others I didn't. Those were more stern, less pleading. Anesthesia, a fog in my lungs was supposed to dissipate, did not. You have to sit up, they said. You have to breathe, they said. I could hear the pleading in between nurses' orders, could hear prayers set upwardly mobile. Still, there was no light, only fog. Faces were not clear to me yet. All of the voices became one. Their pleas were orders. Orders were pleas. I could hear the clock hammering, oh, okay. all of them silent. Could hear the rush of air into the blood pressure cuff. I remember turning my head to the side while they checked my blood pressure. Remember my arm hanging there, but not remembering the word for arm. Thank you. Uh, these next two poems are from a chapbook uh, titled History 2 is a Simple Machine. How you fit a forest between the trees. You shoehorn a dozen damn deer on top of each other, barely leaving room for them to roam in any direction. You remember the carnivore. Release it reluctantly, but necessarily. You chip away a small, southern-facing space for the fallen body. Exposure to sunlight is important, while the skeleton and the remains of the organs take their own sweet time turning to pee. You sigh at the violence you've wrought. You try to make amends. You leave room for the snow to fall. <laughs> Pushes our vessels. When we close our eyes, we don't expect the music issuing forth from the spheres to so closely mimic the voices of our dead. This harmony of hidden engines is a graveyard that raises us, sends us on 365 voyages every year pushes our vessels a little farther from the village that raised us, that taught us to navigate by the stars and by the seat of our pants. And I'm hitting my closest a little hard, sorry about that. Um, I write every day, I've written every day since January 1st, 2010, so we're over, thanks. We're over 3,000 days now, but unfortunately when you write a lot, um, you tend to repeat a lot of images, and the next couple poems, not for any intention of mine, um, revealed uh, the Painted Desert. And I don't know why I've never been to the Painted Desert. I don't, I'm not even sure really which state the Painted Desert is in. <laughs> but here we are. Upon the snout. There will come a day when it will make more sense to fight or fuck for food than it will to keep a foothold in the firm ground. The itch to raise hell instead of raising kids will take you westward and set you down in the painted desert. You will meet your spirit animal upon the snout with a rolled up newspaper, and it will cower in the corner, and it will come when it is called. <laughs> the very first pin. And uh, these next few poems are from my book, The Wild Gospel of Creaming and other sermons from the Rumble Strip. This is the very first pin. Turn down the breathing machines. Their rise and their fall are rippling the local waterways. A riding board drones on, ruining the afternoon. Garrett's speech is still echoing in the farthest reaches of the painted desert, and one man who shares his tent with peyote thinks that the hills are the luckiest man alive. The very first pin striking the very first shell rings as loud as church bells somewhere. Thank you. 
The moon speaks in five haiku. There they go again, kissing beneath me like they invented the move. <laughs> Unoriginal with their passion, darkness in my dress is their release. I am light, but not. I bathe them, but I do not. I am love, but not. The worst metaphor is the one that is secret to everyone else. I wake up jealous of the cancer ward. People there kiss to fight death. Thank you. Uh, some of my poems are somewhat autobiographical and somewhat fictional. This is no different. This is one of them. The Lost White Horses. My grandfather only once told me about the snow ponies. Only once told me how his father never drank on New Year's Eve, never drank at funerals, never drank with the other farmers in town. He would only drink one night a year. He would drink himself to sleep on the night of the first snowfall of every winter. He drank himself to sleep because it should have been easier to see the lost white horses through the blizzard with their eyes blacker than blackest black. Their eyes should have appeared twin lighthouses in negative as beacons reaching out for safety, yet they were not. It should have been easier to see the lost white horses with their eyes bolder than boldest bold. Their eyes were twin steeples under horizontal sky, lost and blinking against the whitest night they'd ever known. <laughs> green become green become blue. I'm going to hit the closest really hard, so I'm going to step back a bit. You can hear the television, and I become the dialogue. I become the words and the music and the nodding head. I become the time between the remote control falling from your hand and its diagonal crash upon the carpet. I become carbonated breaths and candied eyes. I become John Dillinger dancing like Fred Astaire. I become sex. I become all of the eyes that have ever cried over you. I become all of the skies that have ever blued over you. I become a river of violet, a river of violins, a river of violence. I become green, become green, become green, become blue. I become poppies and daffodils and lilies and fingers and legs and elbows and an ill-informed nation of carnations that listen to too much talk radio and use books as doorsteps. I become thought bubbles and submarines and screen doors and silver-scented salamanders. I become Fred Astaire dancing like Salome, toes digging into the still warm body of John the Baptist. I become this blinking digital clock and the loudest alarm. I become the sound of your mother's voice when you thought you'd forgotten it. <laughs> These next four poems uh, are from a chapbook titled 13 Ways of Looking at Lou Reed. Um, it's an homage both to Lou Reed, obviously, but also to uh, Wallace Stevens, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, uh, rather than having the blackbird be the main character of each poem, um, Lou Reed is. Vending machine profiteers. Louder the vending machine profiteers, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, clank, 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 into the cracks in the armor, into the empty, into the Lou Reed skyline above a city he never saw. Louder the boys and girls yelling in their nylon ripcord vocals. Loud are the raw and childish voices of the new silence. All of their vocals. All of their vocals. The fuzz guitars do not sing hallelujah for you, Lou Reed. The singers are asleep in the garden and have forgotten their lines. All of their vocals have been overdubbed, walked upon, set into an infinite loop. Yeah. Impossible to tell. Psychedelic rust, lunar aftermath, amplified, amplified, and after the 11th time, after the 11th time, it becomes impossible to tell whether Lou Reed is saying Lisa says or Jesus saves. Mm. <laughs> Orbit. The meat birds circle wide tonight. Their bones are hollowed with flight and their bills should be hooked with prey. They are hungered. They are unaware. They do not understand orbit. They cannot verbalize trajectory. They do not know Satellite Amour. They do not know Lou Reed, but they can sense his rotting bones. Now it's time to fight with the music stand. Um, 
These poems are mostly new. Um, you may be familiar with some of them if you read any of my work on Facebook. Um, you may not be. Either way, here we are. On the salty flat. Jaw clenches at abstraction like she always does. Jaw cannot chew truth. Jaw pulverizes complex mathematics, grinds until there is nothing left but one and one and one. Jaw cannot chew heaven. Jaw purses her angry lips, spits at the satellites, dislocates herself from herself, and waits to catch the angels on the salty flat of her outstretched tongue. Jaw cannot chew love. Ram refuses to stand in as a sacrifice for all of man's folly. Four calls of the crow before midday sun burned a hole in the dry earth. Empty is as empty does, once filled from wall to wall. Farewell is farewell. War. War is older than war. Blood spills onto the nearest floor. Moon is a curious mirror, never staring back, never singing songs of love or loss, never trying to reveal dark and unseen sides but moon is unduly rugged on the posture. Fracture runs deeper than the saints, too long in every clouded noon, too shrouded, every bone is blood narrow. Thank you. Royal red and blue devotion. Trance, she beckons. Wavelengths drag Wednesdays into Thursdays into royal red and blue devotion, into dark alleys, into wilted parabolas, into small rivers under large moons, into faithless servants, into reversible technology, into nobody's eyes, into the empty bank downtown, into the dovetail joint, into the bone, excuse me, into the bones of Rothko. This, thank you. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the poet John Dorsey, uh, but the other day, yeah. I know, how about for Dorsey? <laughs> Give it up for him, uh, the man who's a crazy man, and crazy an animal, man. and hell of a poet. Um, but the other day he posted something about uh, swimming, and in my head he was swimming in the river. Turns out he was just swimming in a swimming pool, but for this poem he was swimming in a river. Emerging from the river like a new animal, after John Dorsey. Rare are the days in which coming up for air seems like covenant. Uneasy bond between flesh and water, neither side longing for or asking for submission from the other. A cactus, a cactus for your kindness. Long float anonymous races down the river that cannot be stepped into twice. Sky is life, raft is quick, hello is bird in the city singing its good nights to concrete streets and sirens. Um, I was raised in Geauga County, which is about as rural as you get. Um, and so moving to Akron um, it had its uh, differences that I wasn't used to. Um, one of them was sirens, really, at all hours of the night. Um, and when you hear sirens uh, at home, um, you know that sometimes those stories don't end, uh, don't end well. That ancient maneuver. Coming up Dodge Street on trash night, and someone must have been moving out or must have taken advantage of the Memorial Day mattress sale because a giant white mattress was on the curb. Even though we're knee deep in the 21st century, fading sunlight made this mattress look like a Trojan horse knocked sideways. And I was less surprised that the Trojan horse mattress was upended than I was that someone would have tried that ancient maneuver on the sons and daughters of Akron. Our fathers told us long ago to love, but to confirm. Our mothers too taught us long ago. Our mothers taught us trust the heart. Our mothers sang to us, trust the heart. Don't trust anything that comes from the belly, not even your own blood as it spills into a parking lot on South Hawkins. The belly is a liar, and it always has been. And like I had alluded to earlier with uh, the repetition of images with the Painted Desert, um, these, next, uh, these next two poems have car accidents as the focal point. And car accident, I've been into, <laughs> actually I've been in, in, into, the first poem is about the one I was in, the second poem is about uh, an accident that I came upon. 
And one of the things that I realized about car accidents is you don't remember, at least I don't, I don't remember the entire accident. I remember certain fragments, certain weird images, certain focal, certain focuses of the, of the accident. I, I can take that one specific image from the accident, but I, I can't replay the whole thing like a memory. This is about the pull of the accident that I was in. But no squeal of tires. Elton John was on the radio when their metal wrapped perpendicular into our metal. Elton John was playing and the sun was shining in Arizona that afternoon. Elton John was on the radio and sirens were coming from behind buckled quarter panels. Elton John was playing. There was no rain for miles. There were no birds for miles. <laughs> this poem is an, is an accident that I came up with. It's about an accident. Uh, that I came upon uh, driving to work in Solon one morning, and I didn't even realize what it was um, until I had already passed it. The worst apology I've ever offered. Stars were long gone by the time the rain started, and the dark was bored with this warm November. Stars were long gone, but the cement divider still stood sentry at the side of the northbound freeway. Stars were long gone, but the steam coming from the wreckage was damp and inert and probably warm. Stars were long gone, and I was too by the time I realized what I had seen. A crumple of white over your steering wheel could have been a t-shirt and a body, and it could have been your ghost. Stars were long gone, and I was too, and I should have fucking stopped. Thank you. Um, if you've written for any length of time, uh, it's impossible to keep your parents out of your poems. <laughs> it, it just is. If you have any degree of, of uh, autobiography in your poems, your parents are going to end up there. These next couple poems are victim of that. Is the image supposed to be fading like this? Uncreating my mother's china in the year in which I'll turn 50 years old. It's been boxed for decades now. It's been moved from Ohio to Arizona and then back to Ohio. Most of it was bought before I was born. My mother and her mother bought it piece by piece before she even left home. Before she met my father and wed, before she miscarried the daughter for whom the China was intended. I unwrap each piece from hand towels, unwrap each piece from newspaper, then soak it in warm water before drying. I count the teacups. I count the saucers, I count the plates. I make note of the missing teacup. I make note of the missing saucer. I make note not to draw parallels. Mm. When that thump, thump, thump you hear is nothing more than your lopsided genealogy catching up to you to say hello. My father is a tombstone. My mother is open wide. She is a ghost of the buffalo, the allegiance, and the flag, the ends that never meet, cobblestone streets, tempered steel, the drowning pool, the stained glass window, a whispered prayer. Uh, this next poem is a first. This is uh, seeing the light of day for the first time tonight. Uh, new shit. Yeah, new shit. Um, my father uh, was a police officer, uh, was mandatory retired after he had his third heart attack on duty. Um, and yeah, yeah, and he carried that violence and that anger uh, around with him that caused him to have that heart attack. He carried that around until the day he died. Um, Twelve days before he died, he shot himself in the face. Um, the bullet didn't kill him. Um, it took him 12 days before he did. Twelve days of agony. One for the mother. One for the father. One for the wife you'd abandoned. One for the wife you'd marooned. One for the son who looked like you, one for the son who did not, one for the daughter you'd chosen, one for the daughter you'd pushed aside, one for the sister you'd swindled, one for the handgun, one for the bullet, one for making amends. Thank you. And I'm uh, coming up on this last handful of poems and wanted to bring it up a notch. And these last, this last handful of poems is about um, taking action on behalf of hope and the hope that we have in our hearts. So you try to spare some water in the off chance you might resurrect the flowers in the field. You heard it in a movie or read it in a book somewhere. First, you have to cut small axes in the flesh. Suck poison from the veins if you want any chance of survival. 
but then you wait, realizing that what you do may not be enough. Thank you. Reheating the leftovers. Morning is life is spring in any season when trees are the only ally whose intelligence community you trust. Otherwise, three sides to every story from whosoever created the keyboard and the screen. One if by land and you know it's time to rest by the color of the trees, a matter of when and how to make a mirror. Stranger promises, none know anything of gunpowder with some kind of death valley between now and then. We are one step closer to the reliquary. I suppose it is a kind of armor, the principles of thermodynamics they don't teach you of in school. Breathing. Breathing is not enough when we hold on to our burdens because we know them better than we know what it is like to let go of them. <laughs> although my hands are callous, oh, excuse me, although my hands are not calloused and the shovel may still wound me. And I have dug your grave so many times now when I see your flesh, when I see you dancing in the warm and doting half-shadow of your ancestors, when I see you ignoring the small of summer's back, vibrant green earth and drying pond, I know that the day on which she comes for you will not matter. I am ready. Thank you. And we've got uh, just two more poems left. How to unbuild a box. Identify and attack any nail holes. Remove hinge lid from box. Remove sides from the base. Unassemble butt joint. Uncut your boards. Unmeasure and unmark your boards. Ignore your supplies. Return your wood into tree forms. Leave trees alone. Plant one more just to be safe. Remember the blue sky. And this will be my final poem. It's titled, How to Point Blessings in the Right Direction When They Cannot Find Their Way Home. May they land upon the beautiful narrow, the outstretched hunger, the slow count backward from 10. May they land upon feather and fur, crooked spine and tangled throat, earth and sky. Thank you. I'm super <laughs> anything from the bar, feel free to do that. Of course, if you're tw under 21, then don't, but. Um, and uh, buy things from the merch table. You don't have to be any age for that. There is, uh, some things are in as inexpensive as a dollar. I think the most expensive thing is $20. And we also have our uh, square reader with us. So if you don't have cash with you, that's totally fine. And the fourth thing was the open mic list. So if you've not added yourself to either the recorded or the not recorded portion, Ariana has that she's waving it around. So feel free, feel free to put yourself on there, and we'll be back in like five minutes. Thanks. Do I? Yeah, just go ahead and stop it.